Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the new Harlem ends in a colony? Here we are. Enjoy! Lender Jans, a junior merchant for the Dutch East India Company, or VOC, made an impassioned case to the directors of the Dutch East India Company. He felt that it was entirely in the best interest of the company if they were to establish a fort and supply station at Cape of Good Hope. It was something that had been discussed before, but Jans's petition carried more weight than past discussions. He had just spent nearly a year living with 60 other men in Table Bay, near what is now Cape Town, South Africa, after the wreck of the VOC ship New Harlem, often called just Harlem. Previously, the directors had voiced concerns that the local residents on mainland Africa would prove to be too hostile to settle. Jens dismissed this, pointing out that, in his time in Table Bay, he had kept up a healthy trade with the locals to help feed his men. The directors put this into consideration. It would certainly be convenient to have a settlement in a place where so many of their ships already stopped for fresh water and to hunt. The New Harlem was not a ship that had seemed as though it was going to change the course of history. It was a standard 500-ton Dutch Indiaman. The same type of ship was launched from the Dutch Republic regularly. It also had a standard returner ship cargo of spices and sugar bound back to the Dutch Republic. These were the goods with which the Dutch East India Company had built its vast empire and fortune. Her voyage had also been a routine one until she stopped in Table Bay on an almost entirely still day. They were not even alone. In the distance, another Dutch ship had already found anchor. As evening set in, the weather made a sudden change, and the men on board of the New Harlem found themselves in increasingly shallow water as they drew closer to shore. They attempted to turn the ship, but the winds were not on their side, nor were the waves, which had now grown choppy. The New Harlem was forced onto water too shallow for her and grounded. They tried to stop her progression up the beach by dropping an anchor, but the chain broke and she continued to be pounded by waves, which forced her farther and farther aground. Now in distress, they fired four cannons and lit lanterns to let the other ships in the bay know what had happened to them. By the time that help did arrive, it was very clear to all that the new Harlem was past any saving. The waves had pounded her so far onto the shore that no amount of effort would be able to pull her off. Not only that, but as the waves pounded her, she was becoming in worse and worse shape. Table Bay was a common watering place for ships of all nations, and soon not only the other Dutch ship, but also some men from a nearby English ship came to help. With it clear that the VOC ship was not able to be saved, attention was turned to salvage. Without the space on the other ships for the precious cargo, it was quickly decided that half of the crew would stay on the shore, salvage everything they could, and wait for a rescue ship. The remaining half will be split between the other ships in the bay, return to the Dutch Republic, report what happened, and have a ship sent back to pick up the men and goods that were remaining on the shore of Cape of Good Hope. Jans was in charge of the men who were to remain, and with the help of the men from the other ships in the bay, he started to construct a fort on the beach using the cannons from the now stricken New Harlem as a battery. They were not entirely certain how the local population was going to receive them as newly arrived residents. The fort, commonly called the Zantenburg, or Sand Castle in English, was going to be the home of 60 men for the next year. Once the fort was complete, the ships left, and the remaining men of the New Harlem set about the hard work of salvage. The main concern of the VOC about making a permanent place for their ships to stop and resupply on mainland Africa had always been a determination that the local populations on mainland Africa were all hostile and violent. It was for this reason that the first thing that had been built by the men of the New Harlem had been the fort and battery. However, when the local population, the Khoikhoi, did approach the men of the Zandenburg fort, 
it was not in hostility, and Jantz took the chance to try to solve one of the largest problems that had faced them. They needed fresh meat if they were going to make it through the next year. The Khoi Khoi were herdsmen, and Jantz saw an opportunity. Using items such as copper jewelry from the wrecked New Harlem, Jantz proposed to the Khoi Khoi that they open a trade relationship where the Khoi Khoi would provide them with meat in exchange for goods. The Khoi Khoi agreed, and soon they were coming fairly often, not only with the cattle that Jantz had proposed to trade for, but also crayfish and sheep, which were equally welcome to the men who were mainly living on what goods they were able to salvage from the wreck. Trade was a welcome addition, and helped ensure that they were going to live in peace for their time in Table Bay, but it would not entirely solve their food problems. At one point, a small boatload of the men headed to Robben Island, where Nelson Mandela would be imprisoned centuries later, and returned with 200 penguins and 800 eggs to eat. Jans also wrote of at least one occasion when they witnessed an elephant and a rhinoceros fighting near the fort. His men shot the rhinoceros, and they were able to enjoy that meat as well. Fishing was also always possible, mainly in a nearby river, and so much of their diet became based around what they were able to fish. As for vegetables, Jans ensured that they planted and maintained a garden. With each item of food acquired, he became more and more certain that it would be entirely possible and beneficial for the VOC to start a small colony in the Cape of Good Hope to resupply ships. Though a lot of energy went into finding enough supplies to sustain the men, they did not forget their original purpose of salvaging the valuable goods from the wrecked New Harlem. The main goods were sugar and peppercorns, both valuable commodities that had helped turn the VOC into a giant of international trade. The problem was that the goods were trapped below the decks of the ship. At first, they tried to unload the goods normally, but as water began to make its way into the hold, it became less and less bearable. The water mixed with the spices and sugar and started to ferment, making it so that no one could stand to be below the deck. It was not as though the ship was ever going to sail again anyway, so initially, the men hacked a hole in her deck to help air her out, and it made it easier to reach the cargo. Eventually, they took one of the cannons from the fort and used it to blow holes in the stern of the ship, which made the salvage operation go even more smoothly. Once they could breathe below decks, goods were pulled out of the wreck and dragged into makeshift warehouses that had been built for that purpose. After about four months into their stay, some more VOC Dutch ships made their way into Table Bay. They were not able to take on all of the goods and men from New Harlem, but they did make an offer. Any of the men from the beach salvage camp that wanted to return could go on board their ships to be replaced with men from their own ships. Only two men from the New Harlem accepted the offer, and soon enough, the men of the Table Bay salvage camp were left alone again. On at least one occasion, an English East India ship also made a stop and visited the fort. The Khoi Khoi seized this opportunity, since some of them spoke English, to ask if they could stay near the Zandenburg fort, though Jans turned them down. He did not feel as though they were close enough to become neighbors yet. With the English ship, Jans sent a journal of his time thus far in Table Bay, as well as the other documents he had compiled to be sent to the directors of the VOC. The main source of information for how the men of the New Harlem were living up until this point was Jans's journal, and with it on board of an English ship, we cannot be certain of how the rest of their time was spent. What is known is that almost a year after the New Harlem wrecked, a large returning fleet of VOC ships, including the Dutch ships which had spent some time with them at their fort months earlier, arrived. The goods and men of the New Harlem were loaded onto the fleet, and they headed home. Commander De Jung was given a chance to observe how the men of New Harlem had been able to live, their garden, and their local trade operation. He was only able to acquire vegetables for his fleet there, and when he tried to resupply in St. Helena, a common resupply spot, he found that it had been almost entirely stripped bare of supplies by other ships. 
As a result, many of his men suffered from malnutrition and scurvy on the voyage home. He added his voice to that of Jans to encourage the VOC to make a place of resupply ships on the Cape of Good Hope. If there had been one, his men would not have had to suffer as much. Jans made it a point to mention in his report how open to trade the Koikoi had been, and encouraged the VOC to ensure that anyone that they did appoint to the position of commander of Cape Colony should be welcoming to the opportunities offered by this friendliness. Jans noted that if the locals were treated with politeness and were paid for what was bartered, it would allow for a peaceful and beneficial trade relationship. Unfortunately, the man who was appointed was Jan van Riebeck, a man who held nothing but contempt for the Khoi Khoi. As a result of his action and attitude, war soon followed between the Khoi Khoi and the Dutch, and it would set the tone for the rest of the history of colonialism in South Africa. While the Cape Town settlement was often called the Tavern of the Seas due to it becoming a welcome international resupply and resting spot for ships engaged in East India trade, it was also to become a gateway of colonialism in South Africa and have a permanent impact on the history of the nation. As for New Harlem and the Zandenberg Fort, the remains of both have yet to be found, but not for lack of trying. Dutch-born academic and head of the African Institute for Marine and Underwater Research, Exploration, and Education, Bruno Wertz, has dedicated 30 years to searching for the ship that created Cape Town. This search has been made more difficult not only by the time that has passed, but also by the fact that Table Bay, having been a major layover for ships, often had ships run aground or sink with each one possibly covering or distracting from the wreck of the New Harlem. The search goes on, however, with most of the hope lying in the fact that not all of the cannons and anchors from the New Harlem were salvaged, and they remained with the wreck. If anything remains of the East Indiamen, it would be items like those, which would also be the easiest to identify as being from the right time period and ship type. As of yet, the search goes on for signs of the wreck that changed the course of history. To keep up to date on Bruno Wertz's search for the wreck of the New Harlem, please see the African Institute for Underwater Research, Exploration, and Education website, and for more information about the history of Cape Town, South Africa, and the wreck of the New Harlem, please see our sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.